Hi everybody, I'm going to teach you how to skin and gut and cut up game. This is a squirrel, obviously, a male. It's a young male, it's not sexually mature yet. And my dog got it, so I'm using this for the demo. And what, what you would be doing is if this was large game, is you would have a tripod. Because you're not going to be able to lift that game by your, that, that animal by yourself. You have a tripod like so. The sticks are going to be lashed three across here, three times across and three times around. And you're going to, these will be here and you're going to tie your animal. This, I'm using a vine, but you could use whatever you, whatever cord you got. This is going to go here, tied around the animal's neck or tied to one leg and hanging them up, whichever way you decide to hang it. And you're going to take this and push it. These branches will be spread out. You got points on the ground on the end so that, and this will lift your game off the ground and you'll easily be able to lift it up. Without this, you need to have a pulley system or a small game is no problem. But if you're doing something like a deer or a bear or a hog, you're not going to be able to lift them up if they weigh more than you do. Or even if they lift weigh as much as you do, you're probably not going to be able to pull them up and get it tied off unless there's a pulley system or you use this tripod. This, this, there's three sticks together. One is the middle one is longer, and you take them. You you do a figure eight back and forth between them three times. If it's not three times, they'll slip. Then you wrap each one of them three times, and your leftover cord hangs down. And this is what you're going to tie your game. If you if you're doing a deer, I always skin it around the neck, and then I, I tie it right behind its ears, and I skin it down like this, like you're taking the clothes off of them. But you can easily hang it like this. You could hang a, a, a line off of, once you get it hanging off of one leg, you can tie the other one to one of the posts, have it spread out, and you're gonna, you're gonna slip down the inside of the legs. I usually start right at the body cavity, stick it in here. If it's a deer, I cut the tarsal glands off, so I'm not getting the, the deer scent, the musky scent on the animal meat. They're right on the inside of the, of the knee right here. You're gonna, you're gonna cut them off. I will, if it's a deer, I'm taking the legs and I'm cutting them, the, the lower part of the leg, I'm cutting this right off here, all the way around, just just taking taking it and cutting it. And I'll, I'll take the leg and it will just, you, you just, you know, it'll, it'll snap to the center tendon that's holding it. You're gonna put your knife in there and pop it apart. And you can take each, the bottom legs are a little bit harder. If you have it hanging by this, by this tendon right here, and I'll show you this once I get it apart, you, you, there's a, there's a double, there's a double um, joint here. So you have the one for this part up above and there's the, the one down below. If you don't cut the bottom one, it cuts this tendon loose and then you can't hang the animal this way. You gotta hang it by its neck. Just pointing that out to you. It's a lot of information, I understand that. So you, you got your tripod, you got your animal hanging this way or hanging this way. Um, deer I generally hang by the neck and I, I use my body weight to, to pull the, pull it down. Squirrel skins pretty easily. I can I screwed up today. I was I haven't cut myself bad in like 30 years, but I was trying to open up an old uh, epoxy container that was the, the end. It got glued shut, and I was wiggling the knife in, and I held it out here like this. This isn't how you skin either. You skin so you're you're right here. You're skinning. You know where you're controlling, especially taking the guts out. You're holding the knife. Just like this, because you gotta have one in here. If you're doing a deer or a bear or a hog, you gotta have your hand in there pushing the guts aside so you can cut the diaphragm and get the guts out. Because they're attached to the they're attached to the diaphragm. So you're in there. If you're doing this, you're gonna get cut here, you're gonna get cut here, you're gonna cut your hand because you can't feel where the end of that knife is. If your finger is right on the end of it, you can tell where you're working. And this is this is how you're gonna be working when you're taking the guts out of an animal. Remember this tip because you're going to be bleeding otherwise. I screwed this up so many times when I was young. I'm 69 now. I'm a gray hair and I'm sharing what I know with you to save you a lot of heartache and troubles in the coming years. So squirrel skin is incredibly tough. You, you're not going to just take your knife and stick it in it very easily because it's, it's really tough. Rabbit can skin without even a knife. The, the hide is so thin you can just rip it right off of it. But squirrel is a really tough hide. You can make a bowstring out of it. It's that tough. It's one of the few materials that you can make bowstring out of naturally. So 
when I'm doing this, I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to stick it right in the groin here where it is, this, the height is the thinnest. I, you can do it right down here. It's a little bit harder to get it to start here. If, if I have a, a, a needle point knife, you can probably do that. But otherwise, I'm going to start it right here. And this is where I always start it, right, right behind, right by the animal's vagina or right by the scrotum on a male. And I'm going to take the knife and I'm going to stick it in, pinch it up, pinch it, and stick that knife blade in there. And even though this knife is sharp, if you, you still have to push it to get it to go. Do a little rip, get it to start, and let it to slide, slide right over, rip it again, slide it in, rip it until I get past the kneecap. I want to be past the kneecap. Right to there. Go to the other side, do the same thing. I'm going to go right across the scrotum, slide the knife underneath, and notice my finger is splinted. It, I can't bend that finger because I stabbed it. Cut and rip. In a survival situation, you're eating the entire animal. If this was a small game animal, you all that I would do is I would, and I'm eating the whole thing, I would take this whole animal and I would lay it in the coals and I would burn all the fur off of it because I'm going to be eating the hide too. Unless I'm saving this hide for something else, I'm eating the hide as well. So it, all the hair gets singed off. You're just going to scrape off all the singings, roast the animal in the coals, roll it back and forth. Then I'm going to cut it open and take the guts out. The guts Are the guts edible? You're darn right they're edible. You're going to, you're going to strip out all the undigested food in a squirrel. The stomach may be full of edible nuts. You're going to eat them as well. What's the best bait for squirrels? Save your nuts. If you're if you're looking to be trapping squirrels, you don't. And there's acorns all over the ground. They're not going to go for your acorn in your trap when they're laying all over the ground. You got to make your bait taste different. So you're going to take your acorns and you're going to soak them in water, a couple of changes of hot water, and then roast them. Roast them on the fire. They can keep them right in the husk, or crack the husk. Usually, so that I usually crack the husk so that the the tannic acids can get out. And that's going to be your bait. And I realize this isn't a, isn't a trapping class, but I'm giving you little tips along the way so that you can feed yourself in the coming years. Because if we don't change the path that we're on, we're going to be on our own. The society's not going to be here. So once you get to the knee, you're going to expose the knee on both sides, right? Over here. And on this side. And you're going to take your thumb and you're going to work it inside until you can... Here, pull it down on this side. So you're looking, it's, a, it's the same way on a big game animal as on this little one. I'm going to cut this up just like it was a big game animal. Although you wouldn't do that in a survival situation. From here, on a deer, this part would already be cut off at this joint. But for here, this is a squirrel. And I'm going to be saving that foot because I'm going to be eating it. So you're peeling it right inside out. And it comes right off. Oh, didn't quite come off. So I'll take this and I'll split this hide. And I'll take it right off. I can leave that right on there and cook it that way if I want to. Or I can peel this right off. This hide is edible, perfectly edible. The toenails are not edible, but you can leave them on there. They're just going to be part of your food anyways. You're going to cook it. You get the, the hot water. You're making stew. The hot water is going to take out the food values in any part of the animal. The guts... They're either trap they're they're either your trapping material or you're eating them. The intestines are protein, the stomach is protein, the heart and the liver and the kidneys is, is high energy food. The tongue, very edible, delicious. The brains, 40% fat, 40% protein. It's the highest protein in the whole body. So yes, you want to eat be eating the brains. You're gonna hook your thumbs one one finger this way and one that way. And you're gonna peel it down. And this animal has been frozen. I put it in the freezer so I would have it to teach you. And there, this one came right off. Peel it right off to the toes. Now I have it right to here. Both legs are exposed. I'm gonna slip my finger in here and work it right to the center of the spine. Do it on the other side. Now I've got an open space. It doesn't matter which animal this is, they all have a tail. 
I'm gonna peel this back just a little bit, like so. And there's the anus and the intestines right there. And you got, you got a little bit of shit right there. I'm gonna cut this off right here. Just leave that right there for now because I'm working with the tail. I'm right to here. On a, on a larger game animal, you're gonna, you're gonna take a two sticks and carve a little half moon in them. And you're gonna clamp it on the tail and grab it like this and peel the tail off. For the squirrel, the tail comes off pretty easily. I just catch it with my fingernails and it comes right off. So you're gonna eat the tail as well. This animal is gonna get mashed. If you're making it for stew, you're taking a rock and you're going not necessarily rock on rock. You can use rock on rock, rock on wood, rock on rock. Mash that up into little bitty pieces. You want to be getting the, the minerals and the calcium from out of the bones. You're mashing as small as you can. Everything's getting mashed to hamburger. I'm having a little trouble pulling because this finger hurts like hell. So you get to the guts and they're, see they're starting to tear because this animal is frozen. So I'm going to pinch this right here because I don't want the guts to rip, rip out right yet. On a, on a large game animal, I would have slit this right up, right up to the neck and opened it up like a coat that you're opening up. And I'll, I will do that in a second with this one, just so you understand that. And I would have taken the guts out of the out of the deer or the bear or the hog, which it, whatever it is, whatever large game animal that I have, I'm taking the guts out so they're lighter to drag back. If you got a long drag form, you're just going to open up a short section of the guts and reach inside. You're not going to be able to see what you're doing at all. You're going to do everything by feel. This knife is going to be held right here, and you're going to be moving the guts aside. If you poke the stomach, all the gut juices are going inside your body cavity, and you got to wash it out right away. Or you got the digestive juices are going to start to spoil all the meat that's touching your body cavity. If the animal's been laying for a while, if say it's been in a trap and it's dead, the belly's going to be bloated. It's not going to be, it won't be bad yet, but the, the, within a couple hours, the belly starts to bloat. Now it's really easy to poke that stomach and whoosh, here comes all the gut juices into the body cavity. So you got it. That's, this is what your hand is for. You're pushing the guts aside and you're, you're carefully slicing. And once you get to where the diaphragm is, if you slice, you have to slice the stomach where it comes through the diaphragm. So you're gonna pinch it right there and slice that off and take the guts and move it outside of the body cavity. And then, then it, the, the guts are just gonna run all over the ground, but they're not on your meat. This is what the whole game is about, is to keep your meat as clean as you can. If you screw it up, wash it out. That's all that I can tell you. If you got a roadkill, most of them, their guts are mashed inside. If you can't wash them, don't even bother opening up the body cavity. Just, just leave that. I cut all the meat off the outside of the ribs then. And I, I get all the rest of the meat. If they've been road killed, usually one quarter is mashed really bad. Say this is where it got hit. And in and, and, and the body cavity, the guts are all blown. The only ones that this doesn't happen is when it's a head strike. If they get hit right in the head and they're laying on the side of the road, that's your boom. It's a, it's a great animal. It's in great shape, and you got 99% of the meat is good. The brains will be, you can still use the brains for, for um, uh, well, you can still eat them, but I usually use them for brain and hide then. And this is taking me way longer than it normally does because this finger, I'm, I'm not able to use it, so I'm using, I'm doing the best that I can. Okay, so here comes the guts out. Now we're going to pretend that it was a big game animal. You're going to take it and you're going to slit it right up the front. Just like so. If it, a small game animal like this, I just peel it inside out like a sock. So I can't show you both, so I'm gonna show you big game because it's harder. But you just keep on going, you get to the front shoulders, just like you did with the hind leg. You slip your finger in, you pull it, get to the head, you get to the ear and you, you slit the inside of the ear off. It gets to the eyes, you slit around the eye here and the eyeball. It gets to the tip of the nose and you cut the tip of the nose off. You got a perfect skull for, and I cooked the whole animal just like this. I, I leave this, the head on. Everybody thinks I'm a, some kind of a savage. I like the brains. I like the eyeballs. I like the tongue. I like the jowl meat. It's especially delicious. If this is up to you. I'm not saying you got to eat like I do, but in a survival situation, you will be eating like I do because there's not much meat on a squirrel. 
And if you think it, a squirrel is going to sustain you for days, it's not. This is a one meal for one person. And you're eating the whole animal. If you got to feed two people, you're definitely eating the whole animal. Okay, so here we are. We're right to here. I'm going to continue sli sli slitting this right up to the neck. Just like if it was a big game animal. And you can see, even though this is a very sharp knife, it's not slicing this hide very easily because squirrel is tough. There we go. It's right up to the, right up to his mouth. There we go. And this is how I would be doing a big game animal. A big game animal, I would be slitting it from right here. And I'll do one side one way and I'll show you how to slip, slip the leg out without cutting it on the other side just for small game. Raccoons, possum, skunk. Skunk is very edible. It's white meat. It's not bad at all. Muskrats are delicious. Um, beavers are high fat. Both, both beavers and muskrats are a nice high fat animal as is bear meat. You can see squirrel has almost no fat. It has a little bit of oil in the oiliness in its meat. It doesn't have a lot of fat, even though it eats nuts all the time. So what you want is something that's got fat. And when full survival, you want fat. Trust me, if you've ever done four days of full survival, you want fat by the end of the four days. If you haven't, if you haven't gotten any meat, you want fat. It doesn't matter if you're vegetarian or not, you want fat. That's what vegetable oil is if you're a vegetarian. Nothing wrong with vegetable oil. Just recognize that it's fat. Okay, so this leg, I'm going to peel it just like it was a big game animal. You're working it, working it, working it. Working it, and the gloves don't let me grip very good. If you, if you feel like you need to be wearing gloves on both hands, go ahead and do it. It's a little harder to do it. I, I usually use my bare hands. I don't worry about it. The one thing you want to check the animal for and check yourself afterwards is for ticks. Because survival situation, you got Lyme's disease, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. So you're checking yourself right after you're done with this. I usually, I will usually have my socks tucked inside my pants so they can't get up my pants. And so the only place that they can get in is right here. My shirt is tucked in. They get in right here or they can get in my neck. Those are the only two places and I can usually feel them there. You're just using your awareness skills and not getting yourself in trouble with getting bit by a, a predator. Right here. Working the shoulder loose and you just pull it. Pull it. Work your thumb in and pull it. And this is exactly how you're going to be doing a deer. If you can get the animal while it's cold, I mean not cold, while it's warm and not cold, the hide comes off twice as easy. If you wait until it cools, it's much harder to get the hide off. So this side is going to be just like if it was a squirrel or a raccoon or a fox or a coyote or whatever you whatever animal you happen to get that you have to eat. Um, that's going to be your your food. I have no strength in this I'm trying to pull with my middle finger, so I have to switch hands. So we're getting right to here. Work your thumb in. Work your thumb in. Bend the elbow. Work your finger in the, into that hole. Grab it. It's a, if it's a larger game animal, you're going to cut the fur around the paw before it goes because you can't pull it over the paw. You're going to have to skin the paw out later. Okay, there it is. That's all clean. We're to the head. We're working it up to the head. Just working my thumb in and pulling. I would do a little bit different technique if I was, oh, I see I pulled that ear right, right through. I should have slit that sooner. If you're trying to save the hide for something, I don't usually worry about saving the head on the on the animal anyways. It's Unless you're gonna use it for ceremony or something. It's very hard to tan and it, it, it's not of much use unless you're gonna make a, a, a raccoon hat with the face sticking out or something. So I usually don't worry about saving this part of the hide, but I'm, I'm showing you how to do this. So you're right here. Here's the eyeball. Oops, I made a big eyeball cut. 
right here. Cut around the eye, eyes free. Same thing on the other side, give, give a little pull down. There we go, it's stretched out. Right to here. And we'll stick right in the tear duct in the front part of the eye, you gotta cut it again. And now it should pull right to the tip of the nose. Oops, it's stuck right here. This is partially because it's dried out sitting in the freezer. There it goes, pulled the nose right off. Okay, so here, here's your animal, here's your guts. The guts are already coming out. And like I said, my dog killed this, so it got a little bit mangled up. So what I would do is I would stick my knife in here, run it right up to the diaphragm like so. Open this up, right to the diaphragm. So you have your stomach, you got your intestines, there's the stomach, the, the animal's hungry, it didn't eat anything. This is your bait. Bait for other animals or you can eat the stomach, it's not bad at all. And on a deer, you're gonna take the stomach and you're gonna wrap the heart and the liver and the kidneys in it and you make poor man's stew. You can cook the whole thing over the fire with put water right in the stomach, put sticks to, to hold it and hang it over the fire. You can only use it one time and you get to eat the pot. Here's the liver. And I'm coming down to the diaphragm now. And what I'm going to do with this animal is I'm going to put my knife right up to the top of the rib cage. And I do this with a deer as well, if I can. And open up the whole body cavity right here. Not when I'm dragging it, but when I'm skinning it out, it's way easier. Here's the heart. Right there's the heart. And the animal was not bled out, so it's got a lot of blood. Super delicious, super nutritious. The lungs are entirely edible. I usually give them to my dog, that's her treat, especially when she hunted the animal. So I would I would separate the heart from the lungs. If I'm gonna be carrying the animal, I leave the heart attached in there. I usually leave the lungs inside there until I get back home. If, you, if you're traveling a ways with the animal, you don't wanna leave the guts in there because it's gonna bloat. And after a couple hours, it will start to turn the meat green. So you don't wanna wait on gutting your animal if you're if you're far from camp. Say you got a two hour hike to get back to camp, gut the animal. If it's only 45 minutes, don't worry about it unless it's 95 degrees and you're, then you better gut it pretty quick. So here's all your guts. I've taken the liver out, there's the heart. I've left the, the lungs attached. Here's the stomach and the rest of the guts and they're ready to come out. The kidneys are right here. These are gonna be edible too. I put these aside. There's adrenal glands that are attached right above them that in a survival situation, you're not going to cook the adrenal glands. You're just going to eat them because they're very, very high in vitamin C. So from right here, now the intestines go through the pelvis. So I got to split the pelvis to get that out. The bladder, There's no bladder full of urine. If the bladder is full of urine, I will usually, if it's a female, I'll turn it on its side and squeeze the bladder and let it pee on the ground. If it's a male, I take his penis and I aim it away and I'll squeeze the bladder and get it to empty out. Otherwise, you've got urine on your meat and it'll start to spoil it because it's it's high nitrogen. It's That's what urine does. It, 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 bacteria grows well in a high nitrogen environment. Okay, so here's this. Here's this. The guts have already come out. And you're ready to rinse out your meat if you want to. And I would rinse this. If I was going to cook, cook this as a squirrel. Usually I give my dog the paws after I cook it. I leave the paws right on there. And I, after the cook, she'll eat them. She used to eat them when she was a pup as raw, but she doesn't like paws anymore. She's, she will always eat the tongue if I, or the tail if I give it to her. Um, and if your dog is your hunting dog, she's, she's feeding you. So you got to feed her as well. You can't take all the food that she gives. Guts go here. This is, trapping bait. You can use this for fishing bait. You can use this for fertilizer in your garden. You can use this for any kind of predator that will eat meat. So this is something that you're you're looking to save. This isn't something that you can get discarded. I would strip, if I'm going to use this for bait in a couple days, I'm stripping all the, the undigested food out of it so it doesn't spoil. And then it, it, it will last for a few days. The liver prime for a predator's prime bait it's also prime food for something like a squirrel. They're not going to be getting into all the chemicals and stuff. Heart, definitely eat. 
Kidneys is your filters for the body. High in, high in B vitamins, high in protein. These, these three are the most complete protein for, um, in the whole body, except for the brains. All the organ meats are complete protein. The, the best protein you can have for your body. This is complete protein, but it's not as, w as well balanced as these are more balanced. So something for you to remember. Okay, <clears throat> first thing I do if this is a big game animal, I'm gonna find the joint right here and I'm gonna cut this leg right off. Work it around, cut in right to the right to the hip joint. And you got the hip on this side, you gotta work it in and cut around that hip. On the, on the, there's a little C right here and you gotta cut around that part of it. Get to the, get to where the joint is. And on a deer, it's easier to see that, that joint. And you're gonna cut the, cut the ball. You gotta cut, cut it loose of the ball. And this squirrel is a little bit different than a deer because they fall out of trees and stuff. So they're not, it has a different ball joint. It's a, like a double ball joint. So it's harder to get it out. So here's your, here's your big game animal. First thing I do is I cut this right here, right here, and right here. Now, I've had a lot of experience doing big game animals because I would usually eat four deer a year. <clears throat> I, I, can't, I couldn't legally kill four deer a year up in New York. There's the penis that's also edible. You're gonna you're gonna eat that in a survival situation. You're gonna eat the testicles in a survival situation. You're not gonna waste anything. So <clears throat> I would pick up road kills. It was a two thousand dollar fine if I got caught picking up a deer. So I had a, a system down. I'd see the deer. I'd pull off about fifteen feet in front of it. <clears throat> get out. Look both ways. Make sure there's no police officer coming. Drop my tailgate. I can't get arrested for possession of the deer until the deer's on, in my truck. So I, I drag the deer to my truck, lift it up, lay its front shoulder and its head on the tail on the open tailgate. You can do the same thing with your car. It's got to be the, that front shoulder's got to be inside inside the you you, you got to take a lift the camera up and, and the, the front shoulder's got to be inside the truck. If it's right here, it won't go. It catches right there, and the animal will will not. You can push for all your might. It's got to be right here that the tailgate rests on. If the animal's resting like this, you lift up the hindquarters and you push it in, close up the tailgate. It would take me 30 seconds to get the deer in my truck. Nobody knew that it was there. Once I got, and I jump in my truck, I would be I would be pulled on the side of the road for about 45 seconds, take it home, butcher it up, and I have free meat. It was illegal to pick up the deer. You used to be able to get the deer. They don't allow you to do that anymore. So it's up to you if you want to pick up deer. Maybe in your state you can do it. In this in this state, I can legally harvest 10 deer a year, so I don't even have to worry about picking up roadkill. Although if one gets hit on the road out front here, you're darn right I'm going to pick it up. I've gotten two that way. So you're, what you're going to do is you, you've cut around here, and on a deer, this is not so easy to do. On any animal, it's, it's like your elbow joint sort of. So you work your knife in here, working your knife in, Carefully working it because I'm holding this guy now. And if, if this is a, a big game animal, I would I would cut this right off. If it's hanging by the hindquarters, you do all this first, and this is the last part that comes off. It's as simple as that. So what I do is I get it to this point and I bend it over onto itself and, and dislocate the joint. Now just take it and cut it. You got two pieces. Here's your this is your your hindquarter. And you're gonna, it, this is the inside of the leg. This is the outside of the leg. The inside of the leg, I'm gonna, inside of the leg, I'm, there's a little seam right here. I don't know if you can see it. I'm gonna follow that seam up and separate the muscles. And this is native style butchering. If you have a bandsaw and all that fancy stuff, you can butcher that way. This is not the way that I butcher. I butcher native style and this is how I've always done it. First year I ever got, didn't have a clue what I was doing. Not a clue. I went and got a meat saw, just a hand meat saw to cut up the meat because I didn't know. I didn't know. There's My dad didn't know. So now you've got th this big hunk of meat and there's a couple of muscles here. There's this muscle and then this muscle. So you're going to separate them apart. And this is, this is I make roasts 
out of my big game and I make stew meat. That's my, and you can grind the stew meat into a hamburger if you want to, but there's three muscles here that you separate apart. And it's way easier to show this on a squirrel than it would be on doing a deer. So these muscles are just separated. They go to the side. Here's the lower one. It's still got the bone in it. I, I bone out my meat. This is just the way that I do it. And the bones go into the soup pot. If it's, if it's big game, if it's small game, the whole animal goes in the soup pot. Soup pot. I don't worry about it. Or I'm making a stew. But the animal, the whole, because I'm, I'm living in this society, I don't need the bones so much. If I was in full survival, I wouldn't need these bones mashed to a powder. But I give all the bones to my dog. And if you think she she's not supposed to have bones, she thrives on bones. Okay, so this is cut off. This is saved. This is the other half of this part. So you got, this is, I, you can make sort of a roast out of this little top part. It, and a deer, it would be your top round. Right there, that would, I would probably throw that for stew meat on a, on a smaller animal. And this is, you got a muscle right here. So I separate the muscles right out. And because this is a small game animal, you don't even need to use the knife. But this is, this would be all my roasts right here. This is a, a giant roast. You can cut it in half. You got two roasts out of it. And then you got the lower part. This is, this is your tougher meat. So I generally cut this, this muscle right off here. This is a little baby roast. And the rest all goes for stew meat on a, on a big game animal. I'm just cut, I'm boning everything, slipping my knife in. And it doesn't matter if it's fancy or not. I don't care what it looks like because it's all going to go for stew meat. And Debbie well knows that stew is your mainstay when you're living in full survival. And as grandfather said, you get tired of stew, you make a different stew. But it's your mainstay. And this, this is just all going to go, this all goes for stew meat or it goes in the soup pot. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to waste time uh, cutting every bit of meat off of that because it's going to go in the stew pot. You get to the, you get to the front part. Next thing I do is I take off the shoulder. The, the only thing that holds the shoulders on is muscle. So you, you come in here and you slice right alongside the rib cage. Just like so. And I got some neck meat there by mistake, but just cut the shoulder right off. Shoulders right off, just like that. And this, this, this shoulder blade right here, that's my, that, that's a roast. I don't do anything special with it. I just come in here and I disjoin it. You, you learn to find the, the little spot there. Once you get it to there, bend it. Slip the knife inside. I'm going to have to lay this down. It's too small. That's my shoulder roast. It's a big, this is the biggest roast that I cook up. It's got a bone in it. Tastes delicious. And lots of hunters even throw that away. It's just too much bother. Or they take it to the butcher and the butcher has their bandsaw and he cuts it all to pieces. Uh, teaching a native style, so you're not going to do that. There's a, a muscle right here. This is another roast. This is a tougher roast, but it comes out as a roast, so you can use it for the stew pot. So there's another roast. This is off your front shoulder. All the rest of this, I generally, you got, this is different than on a deer, but you can, you can get a little roast off of here. This is, this would be like our bicep, but it's on the wrong side. So it's a very sinewy muscle. I usually make this into stew, but you can make that into a roast if you wanted to on a big game as well. Bear's anatomy is slightly different. But it's the, I'm giving you the basic principles so you can do any animal that you want to. Like I said, anything raccoon or smaller, I'm just cutting. All I would be doing is I would be cutting each leg off. All four legs come off. And I would be cutting this right here, right at the hips. And then I would cut the head off. And so, and I would, I would cut this right here so that you got your, your, your tenderloins. Most of you there. On big game, you're going to take out the tenderloins. I'm going to take the tenderloins out of this guy. So I would cut off both legs 
or like on a squirrel, I would just cut it right here. It's done. So I don't, I don't even have to worry about it anywhere's in here because it's a small animal. Just throw both legs in the pot. And I would cut the head off and just throw the whole rest in. The, so you don't have to do all this, all this cutting up. But because this is, I'm teaching you how to butcher big game as well. Now, if you have a bird, say it's a, a turkey. The easiest way to do it is to skin them, just like I just did the squirrel. You can pluck all the feathers off them. They're usually, the, usually, especially if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to tear the skin, and then it just it all comes off anyways. So it's easier just to skin them right at the start. They're not going to look like the birds that you buy in the grocery store. And what do you care? It doesn't matter to you. You're, it's food. This is what you're looking for. You want to have food. So this one comes like this, find the joint, bend it backwards, get it opened up, there's the bone, work the knife inside, and this is your shoulder rose. Same thing with this one, you got your bicep right here, you can cut that off, you got a little roast right here you can cut off, or not. This leg's gonna come off, and we're gonna do the same thing as we did on the other side, but I'm not going to do it twice for you because you already know. You can watch this video again and do this exact same thing. So you're, you're looking to, to follow the contour of the body. Get this joint ready to go. Cut right off. And I'm going to do the same thing with this one as I do with this one. By this time, the animal is hanging right here. I've gotten all the legs off and I have this part. If it's a deer or big game, I'm, I'll... Come in here and there's a joint right where the ribs attach to the vertebrae and you can pop each one of these ribs off. If you have a saw, you can cut them off. Um, and in between each one of the ribs, you run your knife and you make them separate ribs. So you just come up and there's a little curve right here. You turn it and you separate each one of these ribs and this would be your barbecued ribs. You just, you can, or you can just throw them in. So each one of these ribs becomes separated. You're going to, Pop it loose up here with your knife. Pop all these ribs loose. I'm not going to do this because it's a squirrel. I'm just explaining what you do. Popping all these ribs loose. This is your flank. It's your flank steak. It's super tough. I would definitely, I mean, I can eat it. And I don't complain about it. It usually goes in the stew pot, so it's tenderized. If it's not in the stew pot, you're going to do the, just like you buy a flank steak in the grocery store. And they have a machine that, breaks up all the muscle fibers so it's not so tough. Same thing. So here's your, your flank steak. You have your tenderloins in the back. They run right up the backbone. So you're gonna work your knife from the hip. I usually start at the top, but this is too wobbly. I'm gonna start at the bottom. Start right at the hips. Work your knife in, right alongside the backbone, all the way up. You're gonna take the, take the tenderloins out. And you can see they, they end right up here in the neck. And it, on a squirrel, there's, there isn't that much tenderloin. This is it right here. You see, it's a little, it's a small muscle. It's covered over with skin. It's going to be the same way on a deer. And you can, you can take the whole thing. You can peel this meat off and use this with the ribs for, for stew meat. Or you can, you can leave it with your, with your back strap. Your back strap is, See all that sinew there, all that whitish? That's sinew. On a deer, you're going to save that. Even on a squirrel, if you need if you need sinew for making snares, this is the material right here. It's really nice. There's one on the other side as well. I can't peel that back because it's attached to the backbone. I got to do the same thing on this side. So what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to cut it right down to the ribs, all the way down, Get it started. Here it comes. It's starting to come. Working your finger in there. See, that's not quite cut there, so I got to cut that. Still attached. And if you end up cutting on the wrong side of the wrong side of the the backbone. 
you just cut it again, which I, which I did. I ran it over on the wrong side. It's a little animal, and I don't usually butcher them this way, but this is me teaching. So you got the tenderloin is coming out. Oops, I just tore it because it's such a little animal. Sorry about that. You're going to do the same thing on the other side. Oh. Right to the hip. Work it loose. And this is your choice meat. It's super tender, super delicious. And you'll love it. You're going to, you're going to wish that you had the whole animal back straps. So there's part of the back strap. I really butchered that up bad. It's hard to get it out on a little animal. There's some of it hanging right there. There's your back straps. The final butchering, you're gonna put your knife in right here, right at the base of the skull, and go, uh, go around the skull like so, all the way around. And this will even work on deer. If you go right at the base of the skull, if you try to do it on the other vertebrae, they don't come loose very easily. And I'm just gonna take this and twist it, and then cut the meat. And now your skull is separated. Here's your rib cage. You got internal. These are the true tenderloins on the on the animal. The others are the back straps. These are super tender. They're so tiny on a squirrel, it's almost impossible to get them out without ripping them apart. But I'll just show you what I'm talking about. They're on either side of the backbone. If the guts are broken, you don't usually eat these because it, it, it tastes like shit because the animal's guts are broken in there. But there's one, I broke part of it, it's right here. Like I said, it's hard to get these out because the animal is so tiny. So you got one on either side of the backbone on the inside. From here, everything is butchered up. I would work the knife in. If you have an ax or a hatchet, this is where you're gonna chop it. Just chop it right open. Obviously this is a squirrel, so I'll use my hand. And this would be your stew pot. The skull, if it's a large game animal, you have your hatchet, you, you strike it right here, right in line with the eye, probably two strikes, bang, bang, right here, one to the back of the head right here, one right here, right across the eyes, and then right one or two right down the center, and you can lift out this whole section of skull and just scoop the brains right out. Getting the tongue out. I usually start right, right at where the point of the jaw is, right in the front where the front teeth are. Work the tip of the knife in. And this guy's so little, I'm gonna choke way up on the knife so I don't stab myself again. Work the knife inside. One word of caution, if, if you think the squirrel is dead, don't pick it up. You always touch any animal. You touch their eye with a stick or the tip of your bow or the barrel of your gun. If their eye flinches, they're still alive and you're going to get the shit kicked out of you. You're going to get the shit bit out of you, one or the other. This guy will bite you and he will bite right through your finger and its teeth will touch between. You want to make sure that they're dead before you're picking them up. A friend of mine was hunting them in the hunting him with a pump-up BB gun, shot the squirrel, went over and picked it up, and it was hanging right on his finger right here, and he's shaking to try to get the darn squirrel loose, and it'll finally let go, but he had a serious wound, and in full survival, you don't want a serious wound. Puncture wounds are the worst. They're very hard to heal. And I'm such a tiny animal, this is, I usually just, boil the whole animal, and then I just crack the skull apart. But because I'm trying to teach you big game, I'm doing my best to get the tongue to come out for you. So 
So it's still attached right here. What a butcher job, I'm telling you. Sorry. It's not working on a, on a squirrel very well. I butchered them all apart. His tongue's all cut to pieces. That's the best that I can show you. You start at the tip. You make a slice down each side of the jawbone to the back. Make sure that the tip is loose. Put your finger inside. Push the tongue through. Grasp it. Pull it out. And you can just cut it off right here. The skull on a, on a small squirrel. It's, it's easy to open up. You just... If you're brain tanning, you'll save the brains. Squirrel hides are a little bit harder to get the fur not to slip. It looks like Maggie grasped him right at the brains because he's got a blood clot right there. That's probably what killed him right away. And there's the brains right there. You're just going to slide your finger inside, scoop them out. And there's your brains for brain tanning or for your high protein food. That's that's the most of, of for for butchering the your your animals. You're going to eat the feet. There's no question about that. The birds you're going to cook and boil the feet and eat them. You're not going to waste a single bit. You can't eat the bird's beak, but you can eat just about everything else. And you can't eat the animal's teeth, but you're going to eat just about every single thing else about them. This this is it. You got a nice hide. You can tan it, stretch it out. There's there's still. Membrane on the inside that you can scrape off. You can use that for food if you're going to tan the hide still. It's still edible. There's not that. It's a pretty clean hide. I didn't leave much flesh on it. So there isn't too much. It's the squirrel tail. If you're not using it for lure or for for fishing or for for whatever. And, and you decide you want to have this to hang on your hat or something. You slide the knife in. You can't dry it just like this. You can see he lost part of his tail. Maggie got him and ripped his tail off. Slide the knife inside and you just slid it right down, right down through. This would be the same with any game animal. You gotta split the tail or it rots if you wanna save the tail. Sorry, I'm struggling with this. It's very hard for, I got my finger splinted so I don't bend it. So it's right in the way for doing all my knife work. Okay, here it goes. And there you go, you got your tail split. And you you tack this out if you wanted it to dry. And then you brain everything. The tail, does, the tail is hard to brain tan, but you got to, everything is opened up. Your hide has to dry. If you just leave it in a pile like this, you can store it if it's cold, no problem. Fold it up. You can put it in a plastic bag if you happen to have plastic and store it for a day or so. You want to keep the flies off of it. They're going to want to lay legs all, eggs all over it. If you, have, if you have maggot eggs on your meat, don't worry about it. They're edible. Or you can just scrape them off, but you're not going to throw the meat about away. The maggots don't hurt your meat value at all. If, you, if your meat turns green, you're not going to eat it. This is a, a you'll, you'll know, all you got to do is, what I do when I pick up a roadkill is the animal's laying there. It's usually laying on its side. And what I, the, the first thing I do is I look at its eye when I get up there. If the eye is sunken in, I know it's too old. I'm not even going to mess with it. But if the eye still looks, it, it looks like a normal eye unless it's been mashed there, which is, which is, second thing I do is I put the, I put my hand right between the animal's hind legs, right, right, in, right in by the crotch. If it's still warm, I know it's fresh. If it's ice cold, clammy, I know it's been laying there for a while. And obviously, if the belly's bloated, if it's been smashed in the belly, the belly doesn't bloat. It's just a, And if I open up the legs and it's all green inside, I know it's no good. I'll just leave it laying there. But you have to understand that in a survival situation, even if the hindquarters are all green and the belly's all green, 
You can take the front shoulders, maybe not right to here, but from right here down, and the hind leg from right here down will still be good meat. Unless it, unless it's got green, and I how I test it is I do. If it smells good, no problem. If it smells, uh, I don't know. I'll cut some of it off. If it smells again, it's good. If it still smells, then I discard it. But you, in in a survival situation, you're not going to waste potential food. If you're messing around with a with a with a hide that is really skanky. I've gotten blood poison in this thumb. All I had was a little scratch right here. And I washed it with hydrogen peroxide. I was working with hides and we were slipping the hair on them. And they were they smelled skanky. You got to change the water every day. And, but uh, it was cold. It was October in Washington State. So the hides weren't slipping that quick. And I was doing dry scrape on them and I wanted the hair to be off. It's way easier to have the hair off when, when you're scraping them. So... Uh, I washed this twice with hydrogen peroxide. It was just a little scrape there I got it from a blackberry bush that day. But I'd been handling the hide, working with it. And I put it back in the water, gone inside, went to bed, four o'clock in the morning. My thumb was hurting so bad. I got up and we didn't have electricity. I turned on a gas light and I looked at my thumb and it was black. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And I, I woke up Lori and I said, Lori, what do I do? This is this is really bad. I'd already washed it real quick, put more hydrogen peroxide on it. We started soaking it in an iodine soak. And by noontime, there's a red line about up to here on my wrist. I said, I got to go to the doctor. It's on a Saturday. I have no health insurance. And we called around and there was a health clinic that was open. And we went there. So it was. It only cost me 50 bucks instead of an emergency room call. And he gave me ampicillin, which is the strongest penicillin. And he said, come back in two weeks. Well, in two weeks, I was all better. I wasn't going to spend another money for another doctor visit. But if that red line starts and you, don't, you do not have a doctor or a hospital to go to, um, I'll, I'll share one thing that the, the Iroquois would do when they got shot in the stomach. I don't know about other native tribes, but a stomach wound is the worst because you got septic poisoning. All your stomach juices are going into your body cavity. And what they would do is they would take green white oak leaves not red oak green white oak i don't know why they had to be white oak i don't know that but they would take the leaves and they would mash them pour hot water over them so it was a poultice and put it right on that wound and it would heal they didn't die from septic poisoning there was a woman that that talked about her being shot when she was captured and the chief was shot in the stomach as well they got back to the village and she said the pain was unbelievable it was just, and she said, even while it was healing, she wished that she had died. It was so, it was so painful. But it healed up. The chief and her both healed up. He he taught her what to do, and she did exactly what he did. And even even today, a stomach wound is you got like a fifty fifty percent chance of surviving, even with all the modern drugs that we have. So this is something to keep in mind. If I had septic poison, I'd be putting that on there. If it doesn't go away, I'm cutting my thumb off. That's the only other choice you got to stop that septic poison. And you're going to slit that open where that red line is going. And you're going to, you're going to be putting um, oak bark wash in there, tannic acid to kill that bacteria because it's septic and it's going to kill you. That's your only choice. You choose, but we're coming into hard times. If things go well, you don't need to even know these skills. But if grandfather's prophecies are right, we either live as children of the earth and the whole society, the whole culture, the whole world shifts to children of the earth and taking care of the earth or we're heading down the wrong path. And this is this is what you have to know. You have to know how to process your food. You have to understand what the animal wants to eat. Your, your primary trap is snares. If you're in full survival, you're going to be setting out snares. It's way easier to to build 10 snares the second day of full survival that Tom gave us in our standard class than it is to build 10 deadfalls. First time I went out setting traps, I, I built a 10 part for 10 deadfalls and it took me about five hours to get those 10, the four out of the 10 deadfalls done. I'd almost smashed, I'd almost broken my hand, the rock had fallen on my hand twice and I'm only trapping squirrels. I thought that I could beat action 
with my reaction and you can't. The rock fell on my hand the first time. I was pulling it out and the rock raked down here, ripped all the skin off my knuckles and my finger. And I said, I'll be more careful the next time. And it wasn't two minutes later. And I'm trying to set a hair trigger because squirrels got a really light touch. And what I didn't realize is bark has no strength. And I was trying to hook it on the bark, carve that bark right off. So you're not even, it's got to be wood on wood on your deadfalls. I'm setting the trap and it comes down again. And oh my God. And then I really thought my hand was broken. Oh, that's it. I didn't set that trap that night. I went home, soaked it, and it was, I could still move it. Everything was all right. It wasn't broken. If it had been for a raccoon, my hand would have definitely been broken. You can't have that happen. The number one thing if you're using deadfalls is you're putting a safety chunk underneath it. It doesn't matter what it is. It's as big as my fist, so my hand doesn't get crushed. So if that deadfall falls, it's going to fall on that safety first before it crushes my hand if you don't do that there's no hospital for you to go to and you're going to be so sad too bad this is this is this is trapping this is how to take care of your meat the small animals you're just going to throw them in the stew pot and cook them up or you're going to and you're going to be eating the whole animal you're going to be mashing the whole thing with a rock because it's all you've got to eat your guts are going to be eaten you're going to strip the poop out you're going to eat it or it's going to, either going to eat it or it's trap and bait. This is, these are your two choices. You, nothing gets wasted in full survival. If nothing else, this is going to be your fertilizer in the garden. I would urinate on it, let it break down for three or four days so the animals don't want to dig it up and use it for fertilizer. If you don't urinate on it, the animals are going to come for that rotten meat and they're going to dig it up and there goes your vegetable garden. The plants that you're trying to grow get dug up and they'll dug, dig them up two weeks later for it. When I, when I had dogs when I was younger, there aren't woodchucks down in Georgia, but up north there's still woodchucks, not so many like when I was a boy because the coyotes have moved in and they, 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 like, to eat, <laughs> they like to eat woodchucks. But when I was a boy, the dogs would kill a woodchuck and they'd drag it on the lawn and they'd leave it there for two or three days until it got nice and rotten and ripe, full of maggots, and they would wolf it right down because it had been tenderized and if the bacteria is already breaking it down, it's easier for them to eat. We don't have, the dog has eight times the hydrochloric acid in their stomach than we do. So you, you don't want to be eating rotten meat. A dog can eat rotten meat and it doesn't affect them. You can't say, well, the dog can do it, I can do it. The Iroquois grew up that way. There's stories about native peoples, Apache eating meat that the army couldn't eat. And they would discard it and they would eat it because they grew up that way. We did not grow up that way. Don't eat rotten meat. If it's green, give it to the dog, do whatever you want with it. I've dragged roadkill deer that were green and stinky like all hell just off the road so the coyotes could eat them. And they were howling in their joy that I'd left them their food that night. Feasting, I go back the next day, there's almost nothing left but bones and the rest is dragged away. They can eat stuff that we can't eat. You have to realize that. The number one thing is you've got to, you're going to cook your food and it's pretty much going to be well done unless it's fresh meat or you're drying it. You're either drying it, and if you're drying it, you're trying to dry it in one day. All your meat is stripped out. This meat would be, all the, you, small game like this, you can't cut all the meat off of it. You're mashing it, spreading it out, hanging it over. It's still got all the sinew holding it together, and you're drying it that way. This is the reality that we're looking at. You've got, you've, you, the meat's gotta be dried, or you gotta eat it right away. You can smoke it, but without salt, it's it's a, it's a tough business to smoke dried meat and not have it start to spoil. It's got to, if you don't have hot sun. I lived in southeast Alaska for three and a half years. It's really hard to dry meat there. It's temperate rainforest. It rains about 250 days out of the year. So either it's by an open fire and you're building a little shelter around it so the heat stays in there. You're not cooking it. It's about two feet above a small fire. You're using mostly coals. You got the fire here, and you're raking the coals underneath it, and you can dry the meat pretty quickly. You're 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 rotating your racks. You have three racks usually, and you you rotate the top one, the bottom one to the top, and the top one to the bottom, as as the bottom one starts to dry more because it doesn't need as much heat. But you you've got to understand about how to dry your meat. You got you're going to have to have a way to store it so the rodents don't get into it. So the the vermin, the insects don't get into your food. How are you going to do that? You're going to make clay pots. 
and they, they got to be tight fitting so that the, ver the rodents can't get into them. You're going to have to seal them so that the, so that the insects don't get into them because domestic beetles will chow on your food and it's not very edible after they start eating their, their shit is all over everything. This is stuff for you to realize. You've got to practice the skills now. You can't say, oh, well, I'm, I'm a fast learner. I'm going to learn them quick later. That's not how it works. This is, this is a reality that we're looking at for the future for our children. you got to teach the children this stuff now, not later. And this is, this is our reality right here. If you got a hunting dog, encourage him to hunt. Every day, I take my dog on a walk. Every day she squirrels, she trees squirrels. Because I trained her to. And she's barking right on the tree. I tell her, get on the tree. She gets on the tree. Because I trained her to that. She was rewarded to do that. This is the game that you got to play. You got to play, well, what if? Not like we're going to change things. I'm always working to change things. That's why I'm teaching you this stuff. It, either there's a few children on the earth left or the whole world becomes children of the earth. That's our two choices. And that's all I got to say. Good luck, everyone.